All right. Okay. okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dennis Leach. Most of you know me. I'm the Director of Transportation for Arlington. Really glad you could join us here at Mobility Lab on a very gray uh, December day. Um, and I, I'm really appreciative of the uh, ability to have Bernd Pierce here this morning uh, to share um, some of their technical expertise. Wanted to just spend a few minutes on how we got here. Uh, Arlington requires a transportation impact assessment or traffic impact assessment uh, for all site plan and use permit development in Arlington. Uh, the requirements are in our 4.1 regulations. It's very general. Um, and increasingly, as we've been successful in shifting people to other modes of travel, um, a traffic only study is kind of anachronistic for our actual experience here in Arlington. Um, and some of our civic associations have targeted our TIA process for different reasons, which is they want us to study even more traffic and they really actually aren't as interested in all the other modes. Uh, so uh, in a dialogue that started down with a Pentagon City uh, site plan amendment, and then carried over to other site plans, the board has gotten into a discussion about TIAs. And uh, as part of that, we in transportation uh, had agreed to do a, a update of our requirements with the idea of really shifting to a truly multimodal transportation assessment that is better aligned with how we develop in Arlington and what all our data shows. Uh, we probably collect more data on actual built <coughs> projects than just about anyone else in the country. We have really good data. And it shows that what we're doing really does work. And uh, particularly with our residential infill, which is mostly what we're seeing in the last few years, um, you know, 60 to 70 percent of all trip making is non-auto, uh, which is great news for the network. Um, and we've also had the cooperation of the development community um, that has voluntarily agreed to start incorporating multimodal transportation assessments into the normal TIA. So we had a couple uh, down in the Crystal City neighborhood, uh, one which is an infill major residential infill project on 23rd Street, and another infill project on the border of Pentagon City, Crystal City, that in fact showed that most travel to and from these residential infill buildings near Metro was non oil. Um, so we embarked on this process. We're, we're calling it an MMTA, a multimodal transportation assessment, really getting rid of the notion that we're doing traffic impact studies. Um, and we have a staff group uh, in transportation that has been working this. Um, and one of the things we want to do with this session this morning <coughs> is that others have ventured forth on this path <coughs> before us. Uh, EPA, and we have Chris Fornash, who used to be at EPA Smart Growth Office, uh, actually funded research in this area. Um, and actually, uh, EPA was the genesis of the mixed-use modeling. And so I'm really pleased to have current peers here this morning to share their experience uh, with, with this modeling and what it mean, what it could mean for us. Um, so this is a real, this is an information session. It's an opportunity to ask a lot of questions, to get familiar with what this can do. Um, believe it or not, it is one of the models that is approved by VDOT uh, for use in the state in evaluating development. And because we fall under state regs, we have to actually pick some form of assessment that is conforms to, this, to their guidelines. Uh, so really pleased to uh, kick this off. Uh, we will have a lot of staff work to do, but there's also going to be a community um, forum on this topic probably in late January. We're still working on pulling that together. And ultimately, we'll be uh, taking a recommended set of actions to the manager and the board in the spring. So with that, Melissa, do you want to add anything else? Uh, I'm still handling some technical difficulties, but um, I did want to actually do around the room introductions because I know a lot of the faces in the room, but I think some of you may, may or may not know one another. 
it. So if we could start with Fair and Pierce, that would be great, and then we'll circle up that way. Sure. Um, I'm Alex Rixey with Fair and Pierce. Um, I lived in the Arlington County actually for a little while before I went out to grad school in California, and that's where I joined Fair and Pierce about seven years ago. Um, and came back to the BC area to help get the BC office going, along with uh, Anjali and Matthew uh, about a couple years ago. So I'm happy to be here to talk about EPA MSD. Yeah, my name's Anjali. Um, as Alex said, I've been with Fair and Pierce for about five <coughs> years. Um, also a native of suburban Maryland and started with the company in Southern California and um, came back to open up the office. And uh, I'll be joining Alex to talk about EPA MXD, but also sharing some of the recent work um, we just wrapped with uh, DC DOT on their new uh, custom trip generation tool. My name is Matthew Ridgeway. I'm also with Fair and Pierce DC. Um, I'm a transplant from San Francisco, California, moving about the same time as, as Alex and, and Anjali. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Andy Smith. I'm with Kinley Moran Associates, and we're working with the county staff on the MMPA <coughs> governance uh, as we speak. So glad to be here. I'm Dan Van Pelt with Grove Slate Associates. We do uh, transportation studies in the county. And I think we probably, our studies are one of the ones that the Civic Association picked on that Dennis uh, mentioned <laughs> earlier. And then we work with, with Dennis and Brian, which is back here, to try to come up with some more multimodal review. And I know that's where we need to new being helpful in that process as we rethink how the CIAs are done. And Felice Bertel, also Robert Gibson, Arlington County uh, DES Development Services. I work on the site plan team, and I'm also working to develop the guidelines for the county. I'm Dan Abrams with Arlington County, uh, Traffic Engineering and Operations. Joanne DeBoer, Arlington County DES Development Services. Sheila McGraw, Arlington Transportation Department. Ross Matters, I'm a planning specialist with the uh, site plan team. Dennis Sellen, I'm with Arlington County DES Development Services, working with Rob and Joanne on site plan projects. Christine Sherman, a planner with uh, Transportation Arlington County Transportation Engineering Office. Bobby, of course, of Arlington Transportation Partners, and Sheila and I both do into family outreach. Melissa McNair, Arlington County TDM and site plan development. Sheila Boker, I'm a traffic engineer with Jim Sign Group. I'm Dayala Mayu. I do outreach with Arlington Transportation Partners commercial and business. I'm Tina Fink, the designer, and we do a range of transportation and work in the county, including traffic and Emily Cayley, also a traffic engineer with Cool Design Group. Lisa Marr with the county, also in development services. Uh, I'm Stephen Graham, I'm the parking <coughs> I'm the Arlington County Parking Manager. Um, Chris Slatt, I'm chair of Arlington County's Transportation Commission, the advisory body that advises the board on transportation issues. Um, Chris is twin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, Chris Warnett. <laughs> uh, I direct the DC office for Nelson Magna Consulting Associates, and we do some of the TV monitoring work for the county. Thank you. Uh, Chris Cabot with Wells and Associates. Stick Chris <laughs> Cabot. <laughs> Chris Cabot. Um, uh, just like Rose Lady. Do a lot of traffic with tax studies for developments in the county. Great. Right. Well, thanks for all the introductions. Was there okay to go ahead, or do you want to try to get the. You can go ahead. I, started. I don't know what's going on, but that just means there's like two people who can. So we're talking right in. <laughs> okay. Everyone here gets to enjoy your presentation. It's recording. So. Yeah. You can move this over here so it doesn't turn around quite so much. Um, so thanks everybody for being here. Um, Anjali and I are going to talk this morning, as we mentioned, about uh, accurate streamlined trip generation um, at the of Arlington County. And so those those two things reflect uh, some of the advancements over just um, plain off-the-shelf ITE trip generation. Um, and go ahead into the agenda. So um, the main the main topic of our <coughs> today is, is the EPA MXD tool and the, the process used for trip generation. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how consultants might use that, um, do a walkthrough of the tool and how it's applied um, to generate, to estimate trip generation at the site level. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about what agencies might be interested in, how they might think about reviewing the results that come out of the EPA MXD process, how they might think about incorporating that into their process in terms of uh, some standardized inputs or, or things to, to be aware of. 
And then uh, Melissa was kind enough to share with us uh, five examples of sites that have actually been constructed and uh, and reviewed in Onondaga County and have subsequently gone back and counted vehicle trips um, in and out of the sites. We get to see how the how the results of the various approaches compare. Um, and then we'll kind of expand on the EPA MXT tool with um, several other advancements that have been made uh, since EPA MXT. Um, so a bit on the uh, the trip generation concept. Um, I think pretty much everyone in the room here is familiar with the development review process. And uh, as part of a, a traffic impact analysis, trip generation is kind of a foundational first step in, in doing that. So it's uh, an estimate of the number of trips, by ideally by mode, uh, that come out of, of a development site. And uh, those are used to estimate the impact of that development on the transportation infrastructure, and then theoretically help to to size the infrastructure appropriately um, in, the, in the event that there are impacts on the infrastructure to uh, potentially implement some mitigations to, to reduce the impacts on the infrastructure. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, several levels of uh, sophistication in trip generation, uh, ranging all the way from the, the most uh, widely used kind of off-the-shelf ITE rates all the way up through a custom generation uh, model um, like we helped to develop for uh, the Demar transportation for DDoT. So uh, first level is the standard ITE trip generation rates, just kind of off the shelf using a uh, number of square feet or number of employees, a single variable to, to estimate trip generation. Um, the second kind of step up from that, which is also included in the handbooks, is to use the regression formulas that are included. So instead of just taking an average rate, um, it's a formula that, that varies as the amount of that land use increases. Um, the third level is to, to use the ITE handbook to make some mixed-use reductions. Um, and then the fourth level that we'll spend most of our time focusing on today is, is the EPA MXD tool itself, which takes into account site context. Um, and then kind of going beyond the EPA MXD tool, I'll talk a little bit about MXD Plus, which incorporates uh, the same sorts of adjustments that are in EPA MXD, but also incorporates uh, some additional trip internalization from NCHRP 684. Uh, and then our, our tool that we've developed, a web-based tool called Main Street that helps to streamline the application of this. Um, so we'll walk you through the EPA MXD tool, which is an Excel-based spreadsheet, um, but this web-based tool helps to uh, streamline that process of applying. And then uh, we'll also talk about the Trips DC tool uh, that we developed for DDOT, which is uh, a custom tool that was estimated from the ground up from data collected in the district specifically. Um, so going back to that first level of, of sophistication, the, the current practice, and by far the most widely used, is the ITE trip generation manual, um, where trip generation is based um, generally on just a single variable, whether that's the number of dwelling units or the square footage of retail or the number of employees of a site. Um, and this is generally collected, well, it's collected all across the country, but the vast majority of the data that's, that's in the ITE database is from single-use locations typically uh, more suburban locations, and so isn't necessarily reflective of the kind of development patterns <coughs> in Arlington County, for example. Um, the other thing to note is that this estimates uh, vehicle trip generation, but doesn't really estimate uh, multimodal trip generation. Um, but there's um, pretty intuitive reason to believe that there are other things that affect the amount of trip generation um, at a site other than just the size of that site. Um, so while uh, ITE only accounts for that one variable, um, there, uh, MXD includes sensitivity to seven variables um, that could potentially influence trip generation. Um, so it's important to keep in mind the, the other types of factors that could influence trip generation at a site where we are right now, looking out the window, um, things like density, the diversity of land uses, um, we have fantastic access to public transportation here. Um, so there are, there are a lot of other factors that we would want to take into effect, into account. Um, and so we refer to these as the seven Ds. So I mentioned a few of those, density of land uses, the diversity of land uses that can uh, help to support transit and also help to support walk trips uh, locally from the site. Uh, the design of the site itself, how, how walkable, how um, transit accessible is it? Destination accessibility, so where is the site located um, regionally and, and how accessible is it to other locations? Uh, distance to transit, if you're close to this. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so distance to transit, if, you're, if you have easy access to public transportation, right here we have Metro Rail, plenty of bus service. 
um, the development scale. So if this is um, not necessarily a site that's well integrated into the surrounding community, but in and of itself has plenty of, of land use mixing, the larger that tends to be, the more likely it is that there are other uh, uses that you could access within the site. Um, and then demographics, uh, household formation, uh, household size, uh, those sorts of factors. Sorry, thanks there. Uh, on the destinations, can you clarify a little bit in, in that destinations uh, proximity to other things that people want to get to, essentially? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the one of the main factors that we look at is access to employment. Um, and so these are all factors that we are taking into account in oh, sorry in EPA MXD, which we'll go into a little more detail on. Jumping around. Um, so as opposed to the idea of just taking a, a single land use and calculating the trip generation from that use, um, EPA MXD takes a series of three reductions for three different uh, effects. So the first one is the idea of internalization, that we're accounting for um, the trips within the site itself that could be handled by just running downstairs for a cup of coffee instead of getting in your car to drive to Starbucks, for example. Um, a walk trip reduction uh, for trips that would leave the site but would leave the site by walking to access adjacent land uses. And then a transit trip reduction uh, due to accessibility to transit that could be made um, by bus or by rail instead of by, by private auto. Um, and so I won't go through all of these, but each one of those reduction factors um, uses uh, one or more of those uh, D's variables. So for internal trip capture, uh, again, the size of the site, the diversity of the, of the land uses there, so jobs and population balance, um, vehicle ownership, uh, for the walk trip reduction, similar things, the design of the, of the neighborhood surrounding the site. And for transit trip reduction, starting to think about things like the accessibility to employment within 30 minutes by transit or within a quarter mile of a transit stop. So EPA MXD was developed from about 250 sites um, from a household travel survey um, from sites across the country. Uh, and was was validated using using the variety of data from a variety of land use contexts. And I will turn it over to Anjali to talk a little bit about how to apply EPA MXD. Okay, yeah, so um, EPA MXD is now available on EPA's website. It's open to the public. You can um, download, it's a spreadsheet tool that's easily used. So. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the consultant perspective, the people who are actually putting together the traffic studies and how it streamlines that process. And then in a little bit, we'll get to the agency perspective, how we want to apply the results. Um, but as a consultant, when we're doing traffic studies, we are working for our client, the property owner. And so trip generation tends to be um, a really important factor because um, in the interest of the property owner, if they're tied, if you're trip generation is overestimating your vehicle trips, then you're essentially overestimating the impacts of the development and the property owner could potentially be tied to um, infrastructure improvements that drive up their costs and potentially, um, I guess, nix their development or, or, or make it less attractive or less worth it to kind of go through with the development. So that's why from the consultant perspective, the accurate streamline process for trip generation tends to be um, pretty important. So we're going to talk about how to apply the model. We're going to go through a demo um, and how the, the Excel spreadsheet tool is kind of preloaded with ITE rates and really streamlines our process um, as opposed to going through for the consultants in the room probably remember it's, it's really familiar to open up that ITE trip generation manual to go through all the volumes, find your land use and choose your formulas, etc. It can take a few hours sometimes. Um, but this, at least with the spreadsheet tool, can kind of cut your time in half. Um, there are some things to consider in applying the tool. There are, you do want to keep in mind um, the data that was used to first develop the model and then make sure that you are applying it correctly. So some things to consider are your project size. The model was built based off of projects that were between um, Five, that were larger than five acres. So um, five acres to 2,000 acres. So, um, so that's the number one thing. Uh, we'll, get down in, we'll get into the details a little bit in terms of, you know, in, especially in our region, 
we have a lot of sites. Most of our sites are less than five acres. So does that mean you're, the tool's automatically out? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means, you know, go into it knowing what you're working with and kind of evaluate your results with that perspective in mind. Um, then you want to consider the land use program. Um, the model was built based off of a mix of land use programs, but you want um, less than 5,000 dwelling units. I know it sounds bizarre, but consider ITE's very suburban data points, which are um, different from the sites that were used for EPA MXD. So you want less than 5,000 dwelling units and you want less than 3 million square feet of retail. So not hard to check that box in this region. The other thing to consider from the consultant perspective, we're often analyzing uh, various scenarios, right? You're, you're analyzing existing, existing plus project, you, you analyze a cumulative or maybe even a horizon year plus project scenario. So um, as Alex mentioned, some of the inputs for the EPA MXD involve, um, involve statistics for employment within one mile and uh, jobs within 30 minutes by transit. So if you're analyzing, you know, 2030 for your project, those numbers could be could be different. Um, so you want to make sure that you're kind of um, applying manual adjustments for those scenarios. OK. So this is the spreadsheet. I myself went and downloaded it from EPA's website. Um, so this is what it's, it currently looks like. Um, you can create, you can input all the yellow highlighted boxes, um, represent manual inputs from the user. Uh, it has tabs that include instructions, it has an input tab, a results tab, so pretty intuitive in how you work through the spreadsheet. Um, you can create your site name so that you can potentially save new versions for different scenarios or different um, development sites, however you want. And then you input your developed area you input the number of intersections. So you want to count the intersections either um, within or on the perimeter of your site. Don't really worry about the unsignalized driveways or anything like that. Um, we're, we're worried where the, the model's considering the number of, um, I guess, signalized main intersections surrounding the site. Um, the rest of the inputs, well, the next two inputs are actually drop down menus. So even if you're not sure, um, about what your input should be. There are clear instructions to clarify um, how you want to use the tool. And then typically there's a drop down that will kind of limit your options so that it can standardize um, the input. So the next question is, is transit present within the site or across the street? So this is a yes or no question. And it really means, you know, is, is do you have a bus stop or a, tran or a rail um, transit station within close proximity? Because that's one of the most influential factors for EPA MXD. Um, it's only more, more than likely the answer to this question, especially in this region, is going to be yes. Um, because the tool is pretty sensitive. It's only this question is used only as a way to zero out that potential um, percent transit trip reduction that Alex talked about in terms of the, the way the model works. So um, if you answer no to this question, that means that there's zero, the model interprets that as zero percent chance of any transit trip reduction, which is really not likely in this region, I would think. So um, more when in doubt, Choose yes. <laughs> um, the next question gets into the land use surrounding area. Is the site in a central business district or a TOD? So this is also a yes or no question. Um, and it really gets into the, the way the model is interpreting what type of retail is present in surrounding the site. So it doesn't, even if you're you're not in a in a, I guess your agency hasn't designated a TOD or, or, a, or a bid or a CBD, um, you really want to ask yourself, what kind of retail is included in my land use program? And if your retail is kind of like what we're seeing today um, with small neighborhood serving retail, coffee shops, um, sandwich shops, Starbucks, et cetera, as opposed to kind of big, big box, bed, bath and beyond, um, I know now we're, we're getting targets downtown, but you know, um, kind of that big box retail, that's the difference for this question. So if you're a neighborhood serving retail, then the answer to this question is yes. 
Um, the next couple of questions are a little, um, are require some work from the consultant. Uh, first is employment within one mile of the MXD of your site, of your project development. And then the next one is employment within a 30 minute transit trip. So these inputs are pretty influential for the model. Um, they really, really uh, influence the walk trip reduction and the transit trip reduction for EPA MXD. So we want to kind of take the time to accurately reflect um, these numbers. And the sources we use are really from, you can use um, the model, you can go to census data, you can um, more, we, we like to use the model just because it's, it's an easier, um, it's an easier, I guess, streamlined process for pulling out that number. So we take the number from the TAZ that the site is located in for employment within one mile. And then for employment within a 30 minute transit trip, um, this is even a little more clunky um, if Alex goes to the next slide. So what we do now is uh, we're using a few different mapping, open source mapping um, services to get to this number. So I went to a website called MathZen, which uh, you input the address for your site and you have all these different capabilities of looking at walk shed, walk shed, bike <coughs> sheds, and even the transit shed. So um, I input the address and I chose transit shed and the map denotes um, the 15 minute, 30 minute, 45 and 60 minute transit sheds for the site. Um, and you can even in the drop downs, you can even select, you know, don't include certain providers. So for example, when you first, when you first input it, it, it includes Amtrak. So I made sure to exclude Amtrak and everything like that. So I take my screenshot and I save this for my records and then I go to another site to actually get my employment within 30 minutes. So in EPA MXD in the instructions, it provides um, certain options for how to get these numbers. One of which or the, the easiest is to go to, um, to go to census and you can draw your own polygon to calculate a, a number of factors, one of which is employment. So I match my screenshot from MapZen for the 30 minute transit shed, and I draw a polygon roughly within the mapping service, and I select, you know, um, I select the total jobs for that area, and I spit out this number. And that's the number I'm inputting into EPA MXD, yeah. Where, where's this map coming from again? Is this it, is from Census. So this is from, the LEHT on the map website. So that's also okay. yeah, open and publicly available. Yeah. So a little clunky, but still better. <laughs> yeah. I had a couple of questions, but two slides back, so I don't want to interrupt you if you're. If you need to, um, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. Go back to the site input. input slide. Yeah. Just on the geographic, so the developed area. Is that the site itself, or because it says include streets? So are we talking about the private streets within the site, or are we talking about the public right of way that is adjacent to the site? How are we? How do we define that? Sure, good question. Um, we are including the private streets. We are including um, parking lots on the site if, if there's a surface parking lot included. Um, you want to include some right of way. Yeah. But does that? So it's basically within the. The site, the private property, or the boundaries of the site itself. Right. right? It's yeah. Not, not any of the the external right of way, public right of way. No. Uh, is, okay. Correct. And then the the, the intersections. Um, it says we yeah, have like intersections at the within or at the perimeter of the site. I guess I'm just trying to understand. Like we'll have a study area, but we we'll may not identify how 15 intersections. Right. It's not but, the same as okay. the study area intersections. It's really just adjacent to the site. So um, it may be, but it's it, it may be probably within. Say your your site is on a street corner, and your but it doesn't take up the full block. Say it takes up a quarter of the block, and maybe there's an alley that goes on the back side for loading. Okay. So at that, so really your your site is on the is on the corner, but you only have this is the only intersection that you're counting right. because you're not really even to go to this intersection or to this intersection is still not considered in this value. Okay. Is that just to try to get a sense of porosity of the site? I'm guessing I'm trying to understand how that all 
because again, it goes back to trying to understand how the model. Yeah, is, yeah. Model um, if you can go back to the inputs table mm -hmm. with the checks, oh. yeah. Oh, sorry. Very <laughs> So it's starting to get into number of intersections per square mile, that sort of sensitivity, um, even though we're not inputting number of intersections per square mile, but it's starting to get into those um, input variables for the model. So if you, if you had that input wrong, I guess, or didn't input that properly, that could make, could that make a big difference in terms of what the model is going to spit out. It could, but to be honest, the, the model is most sensitive to the employment. Any other questions? Great. So we've gotten our um, employment within one mile, and we've gotten our job within 30 minutes by transit. And we're moving on to section two, um, where I would recommend, section two is here, but we typically recommend that you kind of leave section two alone. Um, Alex didn't get into this in the development of the model, but the way the model was um, built based off of daily data from Household Travel Survey and then was validated based on daily data. So in our traffic studies, we're mostly concerned with the peak hours. So the way the model works is it, it calculates the probability of uh, internal capture the probability of a walk trip and the probability of a transit trip for daily. And then the model was built to apply those same percentages to the AM and PM peaks. And so that's what we're getting into here, as well as the, for the conversion factors, if you wanted to do any manual inputs, that would be in section two, but it the, the model is very sensitive to these inputs as well. So first shown here are the conversion factors with average household size and jobs per thousand square feet. Um, this is really interesting as well because, as I said, the model is based off of the household travel survey and that an average um, household size. And so even when we were running through some of the sites that Melissa sent us, reading in the description of the of the dwelling units where there are some, we had some sites with larger dwelling units with four bedrooms, three bedrooms, which is um, pretty different from the average multifamily household size that the model was built off of. So that's how, so in the process of testing some of these case studies, we, we considered some manual inputs, um, but even, even then it was kind of, you're, you're not seeing a lot of, um, impact on the AM and PM because you're really concerned about daily, if that the way the model works. Can you, yeah. can you repeat that? Because on the one hand you're saying it's very sensitive to it, but then the AM PM peak it's not. Right. Because the AM and PM peak, the percentages are the same from daily. So what we're what we're really concerned about are how the daily percentages are validated, which was based off of the um, household travel survey averaged over those almost 250 sites. So when you're, when in doubt, we leave these conversion factors as they are. It would only be when you're reviewing your results and, you're, and you think this isn't really reasonable for my specific project site, my land uses, my, um, my household size that I need to revisit these conversion factors. And probably more, I think you're about to get to this, but even more significant than these conversion factors for household size and jobs. And if, you, if you treat these by a lot, that'll have a big effect, but the, the next part is the one that really significantly affects, yeah. um, <clears throat> affects the AM PM split, which is the trips, the trip purposes. Um, so <laughs> home based work versus home based other. Um, because it was all, as Anjali was describing, it's all estimated at the daily level. Um, that affects the way that the uh, that it's split among the AM and PM periods. Is that is that what it's like? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> so this gets into um, 
what Alex was saying a little bit as well, where the splits are based off of the productions and attractions, um, <clears throat> the splits from NCHRP. And so again, we strongly recommend that these are left as is in the um, application, unless you're, you're really working with a project that's isolated or that you're, you're really, maybe a school that has really peaking, really significant uh, peaking characteristics that are unique. Um, then we recommend that these um, NCHRP splits remain as is. Okay, section three is where we get into starting to estimate the raw ITE trips. Um, and as I mentioned, this the one of the benefits of ETA MXD is that it's kind of all preloaded with the ITE rates. This is preloaded for um, ITE's ninth edition. And um, we, with selecting your various land use programmings, let's say in this case, we're using a site that has some apartment and some uh, neighborhood retail. So we're looking at ITE kind of breaks up the, the multifamily with high rise apartments, low rise apartments or general. Um, EPA MXD is, is, was built for kind of just general multifamily. Um, it's, applying, uh, it's applying ITE's um, land use code 220, just general apartments. Um, and then you have varying um, aspects for uh, types of retail, supermarket, bank, general retail. Uh, it includes some office options as well. And over here, for your trip equation method, you can select, you can apply the ITE trip generation methodology to um, accurately estimate your raw ITE trips. And so if we go to the next slide, um, just as a refresher for that ITE trip generation methodology, <laughs> um, this is just kind of a sample output from ITE. When we're typically in, in the methodology, you're choosing whether to use the equation or just apply the average rate. Um, there are many agencies that just say over across the board, we're applying the average rate, but one level of sophistication beyond that is applying the equations. And you determine if you're gonna apply the equations, you don't wanna just apply it um, blindly. You wanna go through and make sure that the land use has, sat, has checked the boxes and is acceptable to use. And those boxes are to make sure that you have at least <coughs> 20 studies that the rates are based off of, that you have an R squared greater than 0.75, R squared kind of um, represents how well the data correlates. And, um, and then you wanna make sure that you are provided an equation because some of the land use codes don't provide an equation. So if these boxes are checked, then you can apply your either your equation, whether it's a linear or logarithmic um, equation. And that's how you select your, uh, your, from the drop down menu within the EPA MXD spreadsheet. And sorry, can you go back two slides? So that's how you're selecting from these drop down menus, and the daily AM and PM peak hour trips are automatically calculating from the spreadsheet just as soon as you select your equation. That's yeah. going to be updated for the tenth edition IT, or how that's going to be integrated. Yeah, great question. We are currently evaluating um, the IT tenth edition and whether this needs to be how well it still validates and whether it needs to be updated. Um, there are a number of updates with the tenth edition in terms of place type and things like that. So um, we're we're as we speak evaluating how all of our tools uh, work with IT. And then we'll get, once you uh, finish all your inputs, then you um, go to your results tab. And so your results tab will output your, um, your baseline external trips from ITE. That's in the top row. You have daily AM and PM. And then it shows you your percent uh, reductions for internal trip capture, for a walk, for transit. And it also applies those percentages to give you the raw numbers as well. Um, we take our external vehicle trips from these adjusted numbers. This is what in our in our traffic studies, instead of um, applying the ITE, AM and PM peak hour trips, 
we're simply just using these as our trips to apply our inbound and outbound splits and, and um, continuing through our traffic analysis that way. So you can see how what kind of trip reductions we're getting. Um, and we'll get into some other case studies in a little bit. Um, any questions on on that? Yeah. Can you repeat the NCR, NCHRP project number you keep referring to? Uh, 684. Okay. Is that the one that generated MXD or is it a different one? Not yet. So EPA MXD doesn't include the implementation oh. from NCHRP 684. 684 has, um, we'll talk in a minute about uh, MXD Plus, which is basically incorporated that, that type of internalization. Can I just provide some history? The yeah. MXD tool that for EPA is over a decade old. Uh, so this is really old research. And so the other step that we're going to talk about is much more current. It's one of the reasons that I think we're kind of sort of walking through this is that, and, and walking into it for ourselves as well, because we don't use this tool. Uh, we use the evolutions of it that are any steps beyond this. But we still wanted to walk you through mm -hmm. where it came from. Okay, so um, Melissa asked us to talk a little bit about how the tool could be applied in Arlington County and, um, you know, what, what inputs are optional, what where is there opportunity to standardize the, the inputs for implementation in Arlington County? And so it really gets into um, going back to the NCHRP, the NCHRP factors, the AM and PM peak hour modules. Um, you could just say kind of right off the board, we're not, we're not manually adjusting these inputs. We're keeping the splits as they are. Um, they've been shown to apply accurately for Arlington County. Um, you could also talk about site-specific internalization. Um, you could also standardize saying, you know, we don't want to, to um, manually adjust the site-specific internalization, which gets back to um, some of those unique land uses, or maybe we're only going to do it for a school, for a, an elementary school or something like that that has significant um, peaking characteristics. Um, you could also standardize um, inputs for the, the CBD TOD questions, you could set thresholds for if you're if you're just to make it super streamlined for a consultant um, and um, and how you want to apply you uh, sorry, you could make those streamlined so that you have uh, maybe a distance threshold for if your bus stop or rail stop is within you know um, a quarter mile or a half mile, then you're saying yes to these questions or if you want to uh, put together an approved list of um, of neighborhoods or or bids that would automatically say yes to the CBD TOD question, um, those are opportunities to kind of uh, easily implement the tool in Arlington County. Um, and so. Yeah, we wanted to have a little bit of a discussion or get some input from folks mm -hmm. from the agency perspective who, um, how they might, uh, kind of what their interests are in, in the UMXD process. And one of the things that we think it can be helpful for is just informing decision making about land use patterns, thinking about um, the ability to actually approve development in locations uh, where it might be desired, but might traditionally be, be a challenge using uh, conventional trip generation rates. Um, so I know we have folks here from a lot of folks from Arlington and a few folks from from other places and just wanted to hear a little bit about if there are questions or thoughts about uh, using this in the, in the development process. I just um, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, transit because um, I wanted to know if that the question about the presence of transit, you elaborate on that in your um, calculations at all? Meaning, is there any distinction between fixed rail, fixed skyway transit versus bus transit, um, you know, headways, hours of service, things like that? Is that good? Yeah. Sure. Um, good question. It is not sensitive to, to varying uh, types of transit. EPA MXD is not sensitive to varying types of transit. As Matthew mentioned, um, it's more than a decade old. Um, it is sensitive, however, with, with improved headways with different types of transit, then um, that would influence the number of jobs that are accessible 
by transit. And so theoretically, that would be captured in uh, either the MWCOG model or, um, or census data as well as you're thinking about. And even if you're thinking about uh, your future scenarios that you're evaluating, maybe cumulative plus project where um, BRT is going to be present and more jobs would be accessible. So that would be a case where you want to manually adjust that jobs within 30 minutes by transit. And that, that is a really important consideration and one that we'll talk about when we start talking about trips DC. That is one of the variables that we took into consideration um, developing a more tailored model. Was was there a general threshold plus or minus sort of for acceptability on accuracy? Like plus or minus 20%, you know, from observed or 5%. How, how close did this sort of start to dial in even 10 years ago from the observed 200 and some sites versus what the model predicted? Yeah, great question. That's a good question. Um, I don't know what the threshold was. I know so I there think was... I'm the only one who dates back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, there wasn't a threshold that which we said was just, the, it was really more comparison. It was a comparison of raw ITE of ITE handbook uh, with what we were getting out of the tool and a comparison with that with observed data. Um, and what I can say is that the, the, this tool performed far better. Uh, and we only tested it in urban contexts, but and some suburban, but not in rural contexts. Um, this tool performed far better. So I think on average it was within 4%, uh, whereas the raw ITE was something like 30% over predicting and and the ITP handbook, and this is all from memory. So right. Yeah, the EPA estimate I think was like eight, and then when we start talking about MXT plus, that, that gets even closer to okay. about four percent. Do you have those slides later? Well, no, yeah, those are in here. Okay. And it might help better better in the case that case studies for Arlington specifically. <laughs> yeah. So back to Matthew's original little point a little while ago in terms of, I mean, it seemed like it's replicating what is out there pretty well, from what you said. Yeah. So why isn't this used now? Like you said, it's a decade old, but well, so other things that have superseded it that you would recommend us using, or or can you elaborate so on that? Or is that what sure? You're or, and yeah, and we both. Yeah. Yeah, that's a okay. great question right. too. That's so yes, really I think we get to is like you know what is going to help us. Yeah, I think yeah. we'll get there. And so yeah, maybe it's kind of a good, better, best sort of a question. And so yes, this does a pretty good job of, of replicating what yeah observed conditions. Um, but we'll show some examples as we go through the different iterations of the tools and how well they compare to the national validation that we did and then also for the five sites. And, and maybe also focus on the county. elements that we automated, because some of the pushback was really about, this is more difficult, I don't want to spend the time doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, sorry, just one last point on that is, um, well, Melissa mentioned that VDOT does uh, list out EPA MXD as an approved tool. Um, MXD Plus, which we'll get into after um, we take a little stretch break, but uh, MXD Plus is mentioned in ITE's 9th edition and 10th edition as um, resources available as well. And ITE has always said, when available, use local data, um, which was a big influence for DDOT as well. So um, I think you'll be, you'll like what we have to show you. Yeah. I think I should probably hold my question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So we have, this is mostly going to be applied to the metro corridors. There's an excess of 60 million square feet of infill <coughs> mixed use development already here. So our standard project is not like an acre or five acres. It's maybe a quarter acre or a half acre, half million square feet on the high end, probably 250,000 square feet on the low end. And it's like, how does that project fit into an existing very urban context? And yeah. so I'm really interested with MXT. Did you do additional data collection? Did you incorporate more sites that are really urban infill sites and, and not sort of suburban? I mean, if you're up to five acres, it's almost suburban greenfield yeah. or brownfield redevelopment. It's not. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <For the Cambridge. laughs> well, there we, 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 we Occasionally we have them, but I mean, our typical site plan use permit yeah. is almost invariably less than a city block. Actually, can I elaborate on that question real quick? Sure. I think one of the one of the things that I can, I'm concerned about is that a five acre development based on density looks different everywhere in the country. So here we could be getting 
you know, five acre townhouse she yields in half an acre, you know, like, yeah. And so was it five acres was the threshold or was it a development metric? Like It's only because to? that's what the model was built off of. So it's it's just a it's just a I guess a informational piece to say proceed with this with awareness. Um, in our case studies, almost all of the sites, all five sites, were under five acres, and you'll be able to see the results um, that that we came up with. And then uh, I think your all of these points are really getting to the heart of. Yes, it is every it is different everywhere in the country, and how do we reflect what's really happening in our community here? And um, I think those are um, all, I, I guess, premises for uh, the evolution of the Trips DC tool. And um, maybe Anna can share a little bit about that project and how it it came about. It was a multi year effort, so um, but definitely exactly what you're talking about was kind of the, the genesis of that custom trip generation tool. But if I can really, I was going to say really briefly before that, if um, so the, the five acres applies to the EPA MXD, and I don't know the exact range of sizes for MXD plus, um, but one of the things when we start describing MXD plus on Main Street that we do before we enter a project into that process is we have something called page zero, which is our kind of, is this even applicable test at the beginning? And so it, it shows kind of a distribution of all the different site characteristics. And we've, we've applied that extensively now and haven't had small sites be a, be a problem. So I, I'm pretty sure that the MXD Plus research that incorporated additional sites was based on more urban and smaller footprint sites. So, so the history is that if you're looking, I mean, if you're looking to develop this from scratch, you want to, you want to do surveys of fairly large developments because you want sort of, you don't want to have some uh, sort of abnormalities about an individual dwelling unit sort of mess up your data. Um, but then the, the sort of consequence of that is that if you do a statistical model, you really only want to use that model to predict within the range of, of things that your data is based on. So it's not that it can't do something less than five acres, it's just we're saying, hey, the model wasn't based on anything less than five acres, so be cautious. Um, that's so, uh, kind of a question related to this, but like check my logic here. So the, it strikes me that this is important. The project size is most important for um, estimates of internal trip capture, because like if you have a larger site, yeah. it means that there's fewer trips leaving the site, potentially. And it also lends to your density, the way when you're inputting your <laughs> your land use programming on, on your pro your site size, then it's, it's okay. yeah. So if we, and the, the, the output is meant to be, say we were talking about a five acre site, the trips that we're talking about are like outside of the five acres, right? Yeah, right. okay. So, I mean, it strikes me that maybe then what we're just limiting, if we want to, you know, proceed with caution on this, it has to do more with how much of its internal trip capture as opposed to like mode, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Correct. Yes. Um, I noticed that we're on version four. I just want to know, like, what type of elements have been updated throughout the years? And if, like, it's open to the public, are, you, are we allowed to comment on what elements we want to be updated, or is that something that maybe MXC Plus is catered towards? Um, so, first, quite first part of that question: EPA MXD has been updated over the years. I think it was it was first the research started in 2008. Um, so I don't know what ITE trip generation manual we were on at that point, but it's been updated. Um, it went through a validation process for version nine, so that's kind of. Uh, the latest version four. In terms of, it's it's available on EPA's website. In terms of opportunities to comment on it, um, I don't think they would say no to your comment. Um, I don't know what opportunities there are to update it. Uh, Fair and Peers internally has moved on to um, to developing our kind of own in-house tools, which are MXD Plus and Main Street, and um, that's what we use internally for our tools, for our traffic studies and um, projects. And it's kind of, it's been uh, defended in a few different times um, across the country now. And so it's kind of a, a standalone tool. Um, and as mentioned in the ITE handbook, the MX yeah. not, so Main Street is, sorry, we haven't 
laid all the groundwork for you knowing what all these things are yet, but we'll get there. Um, so Main Street is the web-based tool that implements MXT Plus, but the MXT Plus approach is, is mentioned in the IT handbook as one of the ways that you can use your best judgment to make adjustments to the ITE trip rates. Yeah. And there have been conversations with ITE. Um, you know, they're very, obviously, because it's mentioned in their in their manuals, so they're aware that MXD Plus is, is available as a resource. Um, yeah. Is MXD also generating, so I, I, you shared how it should, uh, generates any trip estimates, but is it also generating other trip estimates and distributing those to the other modes? No. Okay. All of the cuts are reductions of auto trips, and all okay. the trips are in terms of auto trips. Another. So those trips that were listed as as transit or walk trips that were reduced from the vehicle trips, those are not transit trips or walk trips, or would they be considered? They are. It wasn't validated to that level. So, yeah. so the overall <laughs> outcome here, we're, we're confident in the number of vehicle trips that result. Between sure. how much of that really is internalization, sure. really is walk, and really is transit, we're not as confident because that hasn't been specifically validated. But the outcome of that three-step process, that final result number, is what's been validated. Okay. Yeah, so I guess, and maybe you're going to do this and jump ahead. But, um, then how will we apply that? Because we're trying to, we're we're always trying to get the vehicle trips right, right? I mean, that's the thing that is the most usually usually the most impactful on right. the roadway network. But then we're trying to come up with some projection of the other other modes. So. Do we, is there a methodology that you've seen that seems to make sense that then we go back to IT and we look at the trip, vehicular trips and see what our reduction is from that based on what comes out of the model and then that, that's that's going to get us to our other modes. So I guess I'm trying to trying to think about you know, then how we use it to get us to those other all, all trips. Yeah. Um, with EPA MXD, it's a little difficult. You could apply the percent reductions. I guess it's also a frame of reference of um, what are you currently using, and is this at least, it's not perfect, but is it at least better than what you're currently using? Um, and then there are varying, local data is always preferred. That's the number one. Um, then as we get into MXD plus, where it was, validated for additional sites, then we start to feel like the percent reductions are a little bit more um, a little bit more reliable in terms of mode. And now um, we'll, we'll talk about this, but uh, MXD and Main Street actually estimates person trips. So we're starting to get to those evolutions. Um, and trips DC actually, and, sorry. Yeah, and trips DC is its own standalone custom trip generation tool for all four modes. And it was validated to that point. So this is why we're, I, I think you guys are really catching on to really the seven levels of sophistication of trip generation. Um, sounds like you guys are ready at level mm -hmm. six or seven, so. <laughs> which is great. We're taking a break. Yeah, I think we wanted to allow um, maybe a little stretch break, a little restroom break before we get into the case studies and then moving on to um, some of the other applications, tool applications. So feel free to take five and then we'll gather back here. Okay. Thank you. The bathroom codes are on the front wall. So we're we're probably much closer to what we need. But now we're expecting more things I saw a lot of people popping on as we were talking. Which I mean, it's really a good one. Right. And we have a lot of field quality data. 
Yeah, so every oh, site when I use it, it's all like it's going to be wider. Yeah, I was, I was like, I don't know, but I don't know. It's going to be two years. And I think it's going to be two years. I don't know. It's going to be two years. I don't know. It's going to be two years. Yeah, right. It's going to be two years. It's going to be two years. Very hard. It's going to be two years. It's going to be two years. Actually, doing building surveys, doing garage two counts. Yeah, so yeah, we actually help a lot. I think that it shows that our infill purpose, but you know, we're like trying to focus on that. Percent of IT, more or less. Like the auto, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then we're going to have to do it for a while. The five acre question is interesting, too. I think it's all auto. We know we are collecting. The, the garage data is all data, but the survey data gets uh, mm -hmm. help into a travel. Okay, so like and I think the MST file kind of a bit 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 but the range, I mean, well, because that makes it easier to text like, are you going to do a certain standard deviation? And it's like, it might not be average size, it's three acres, it might be the average size of three acres, but I think there are sites that are, you know, I think the acres are going to be as well as it's a little bit of Although, right now, there's generally in the core of the region, it's in the office. Is really solid. So mostly what we're seeing is high density residential. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it, but that tool, like we could expand the gas like Yeah, yeah. 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 as well as breaking those up. What did they crash? So very, very recent. Right, this is a question also. It's a big series. Well, good. I was just saying that, like, we, like, kind of people who go online beyond the FDA and NXT. Yeah. So it's kind of like, okay. So, up to the Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, and that and actually could because you can be less flexible, but also be more sure. segment we're going to get down to the really exciting part which is to actually share the results of um, the five sites that we received so Melissa is able to provide us with um, the traffic studies from five sites in Ellington County that included the actual uh, vehicle trip counts in and out of the site so we'll present the results of um, at this point just the EPA NXD and ITE um, and actual counts um, and then as we unroll the rest of the tools and describe them we'll show also how those results compare so it seems like the group is antsy for the really juicy stuff at the end so I'm not going to spend too much time on this but we'll just go through it so that you can at least get a get a feel for for what we're looking at you got it all there you go <laughs> good we'll take questions all right so um First site was Dolly Madison, which is a residential only building. Um, not great transit accessibility in terms of pretty low employment within 30 minutes by transit, pretty low employment within one mile. It's right off of 395. Um, this is also one kind of a, a weird one from the set. And even in the traffic study, it, it essentially said how weird the site was because um, you can see even the observed trips are more than the ITE estimates, which I can't, I don't know if I've ever seen that in my career. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, so pretty interesting uh, um, results. But uh, we're not, in running it through EPA MXD, we're not getting a significant reduction. Um, 
mostly due to the em employment accessibility. Um, also interesting on this one, you know, we went back and forth <coughs> running it through the ITE rates. As, as you know, EPA MXD pivots from ITE estimates, so it matters what, what land use code you're selecting. And you could select uh, high-rise apartments, mid-rise, low-rise, or general apartments. Uh, we started out selecting high-rise, but it was it just wasn't really making a lot of sense. Looking back through the description, this uh, apartment building has um, uh, three and four bedroom units in it, which is also really unusual, I feel like. Um, so we uh, went back and, and used kind of the, oh, it even said, it still says high rise, but we used the land use code 220 general. Um, but you can see that even from ITE to EPA MXD, we're not getting a significant reduction um, because of that low employment. So next. <laughs> Um, Gramercy Apartments is a mixed use building. We've got some residential, uh, some neighborhood retail, and um, some medical office. There's a clinic on site. Um, uh, pretty significant employment within one mile and employment within 30 minutes by transit, and we're getting some uh, really decent MXD reductions. Um, you can see from the results. Uh, we have AM in blue, PM in orange, um, compared Can you to talk the. Talk about where this is. Sorry. Oh, um, Pentagon City. <laughs> I just want to make sure some people in the audience know this building and know where it is. We want to make sure everyone knows where it's at. Right. <laughs> we'll shout it out for you. Thank you. Um, so you can see compared to we've got pretty pretty low observed AM and PM uh, peak hour vehicle trips and how significantly ITE um, overestimates, particularly in the PM peak, uh, and the reductions we're getting from EPA MXD. So again, not EPA MXD isn't perfect, but it's at least an improvement on the ITE estimates. Same thing here, Clarendon Center, um, which is near Clarendon Station. And uh, we have a mix of uses, residential, office, uh, grocery store on site, and then some additional neighborhood retail. Um, this is, <clears throat> grocery stores have are kind of a beast of their own in mixed use development we're finding. So it's really um, interesting in the, in the trip making behavior. We are getting, you know, over 30% reductions in AM and PM peaks, um, which is exemplified, again, how, how the, I guess how the improved accuracy you're getting with EPA MXD over ITE. So again, kind of tying it back into how these these estimates are getting applied in a traffic study, they're all they're getting tied into the traffic analysis, the results, developments are getting tied to impacts to the network, and uh, property owners are tied to mitigation improvements um, that is kind of coordinated with the agency. And so to have kind of significant overestimates is does have a does impact the property owner significantly? Do you know roughly the acreage? I mean, all these as we put it out earlier, are well under five acres. So this is a couple acres, probably. Um, this is actually two buildings on sure. either side of Clarendon Boulevard, evaluated as one site. Right. Um, I want to say maybe two and a half acres. Okay, Penrose Center, which is uh, located on Columbia Pike. Um, a mix of land uses, apartments, another grocery store, and some neighborhood serving retail. Um, pretty good transit accessibility with employment uh, within 30 minutes by transit. Um, one key note on this site is that the 30 minute transit shed includes the Pentagon. And so I, I kind of felt some skepticism in the room when we were talking about employment um, from MW Cog model and, and LEHD earlier. And there's good reason for that. Uh, our work in this region has really showed that LEHD, census, and even MW Cog model, they all capture employment differently, particularly for federal jobs. Um, so there, so this employment within 30 minutes by transit has been manually adjusted up to account for the Pentagon, which was not in the in the original kind of going through the methodology that I described earlier, it wasn't included in the estimates. The the initial employment numbers um, from the census were very low. 
and that is going to have a significant impact on our results. Um, going kind of into the weeds a little bit on that question, um, in our work on the TRIPS DC project, we actually created our own employment data set for the district where we merged kind of um, LEHD and census data to create a custom, what we call custom LEHD to account for federal jobs in the district. And this, this also has grocery, which is just wacky. Yes. Yes. Um, Very big grocery. But we also see that in PM. Yeah, that's where the PM. That's why the PM. That's is why the PM said so from AM. Different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but and again, I guess we're just trying to drive home the point of improved accuracy. Yeah. Still not perfect, but yeah. Improved. Not improved enough. <laughs> uh, last site. Um, Four twelve. This or Sedona Slate. This site is, is also interesting. It has a mix of uh, residential and retail, but um, the most of the retail at the time of the data collection was not occupied. There was only one small Jimmy John, so that's why you're only seeing uh, 1,500 square feet of restaurant <laughs> included here. Um, were pretty significant employment within one mile as well as employment within 30 minutes by transit. Um, just in general, the AM observed vehicle trips are, are really low from this site. So even though we're seeing improvement, no one's going to get as close to that accuracy. And one thing to note about this site, it has, it has a pretty robust TDM program. So that's something that's not captured in EPA MXD or even IT, but um, just something to note. It's true of several of the other sites too. Right? Yeah. yeah, in particular, in reading through the traffic studies, um, the, 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 not only was, is there a robust program, but it's actually used by, like, the, <laughs> the residents are really um, participating in the program. Okay. Those are all five sites. We'll revisit them in a little bit. Can you just, with those ITE trips, are those... Any reductions on that calculation? Or no, this is just straight, this is not with the with the, the yeah. And then the, uh, yeah. The unserved are they just the driveway counts or are they? Yes, they are not driveway. Not like on street parking at all. Right? Nope, they're just two okay. counts. Yeah. Pick up on Chris's question. Did you, did you go back and look back to the actual TIAs that were done for these? Projects, they weren't you know, TIAs, they were trip generation studies. So no, not, not, no. In this, not in this I'm exercise. Just curious, what, when the studies were done, what, 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 what did we actually assume? What did we actually estimate? Right. All, something yeah. right. A while back, I tried to put that information together. I think for the first residential aggregate study, we might have a power, an internal PowerPoint slide set that showed um, it showed that. We didn't publish the names of buildings in our, in our aggregate study, so um, it wasn't, yeah. So I'll, it's an exercise that we can do. I will try to do that for these five minutes, just for our own. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> okay. Um, any other questions before we move on to the other tools? So this we'll we'll see those same five sites again. Um, but just wanted to share that in the context of the EPA MXC tool specifically before we start talking about the, the more recent enhancements. Okay. Um, so the same, uh, just as a refresher again, the same seven levels of sophistication ideas. We just talked through the EPA MXD model, and now I'll describe a little bit the MXD Plus model and uh, its implementation in, in Main Street. So uh, two uh, key enhancements with, with MXD Plus, um, as Anjali was mentioning, at the uh, for EPA MXD, everything was estimated and validated at the daily level, and then we have kind of those assumed splits into AM and PM, which which work pretty well. For MXD Plus, um, we actually calculated separate adjustments for the AM and PM periods, so that helps to improve that accuracy a little bit. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, NCHRP 684 um, includes a more advanced technique for, for trip internalization within the site, and MXD Plus incorporates that as well. Um, and then this is the interface for, for Main Street, which is the web-based tool, so kind of two separate concepts, the MXD Plus approach, which is the, um, the regression analysis and everything that goes into calculating those estimates, and uh, Main Street really helps to, to streamline that process. As you were going through some of the things you need to calculate for EPA MXD, you have to go off model and you have to pull on a variety of tools and perform these transit check calculations. Um, and Main Street really helps to, to incorporate all of that and, and streamline it. 
So a refresher on, on these Ds that are incorporated and a little bit of information on the, the data sets that we use to collect them. So all of this is incorporated within a GIS-based engine within the web-based tool. Um, so we pull demographic information from census. So you can also get information from uh, the regional modeler, LEHD. Press the off and then on button again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it just it just like times out after a little bit. It has to like cool off. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so again, the seven D is pulling in all this information and from a variety of sources, and so I'll show you in a little bit how the interface allows you to, to choose among them. Uh, distance to transit, information from the local transit providers, uh, land use databases for the density and diversity variables, uh, looking at the, the roadway network for the design, things like number of intersections per square mile. Um, we use the regional travel demand model to calculate uh, regional accessibility and uh, that by transit and by auto. Um, and then uh, it uses a, a GIS backend process to, to calculate the, the scale of the site so you don't have to go into Google Maps and draw it yourself. <laughs> Um, so that's kind of on the tool side. On the on the development of the data side, uh, we did additional uh, validation. Um, so I think there were about 19 sites that we did the original validation on, collected data on over 200 sites, um, but then independently collected data to validate it. Um, and this expands that to uh, 29 sites um, in, in various regions throughout the country and in various land use contexts, some very urban, some uh, more on the, on the edge of suburban. Um, and again, this is just the idea that Main Street pulls all of this information in. So uh, working with the, uh, the census data for things like density and demographics. Um, we pull information also from the, uh, you might be familiar with the EPA Smart Location Database that calculates things like accessibility. Um, and this is an intersection density calculation. Um, and it, it pulls this all into a backend GIS uh, database that then when you select your site, it'll, it'll automatically calculate and collect all of the information. So this is the well, the second page really. I think I described earlier the, the page zero concept of uh, checking some of the key parameters before you invest the time in, in actually running the tool to make sure that it's appropriate. Um, but this is an example of how you would create a project analysis scenario in Main Street. And so the first thing that you do is identify the site location. Um, you can draw the boundaries of the site. Um, this is an interesting example because we were looking at doing an analysis for the entire neighborhood. So. One mode of using this tool could be to look at an individual site um, and calculate its trip generation characteristics. And another mode of analysis could be to look at the entire neighborhood and what the, uh, the delta is between the entire neighborhood with the project and the entire neighborhood without the project. That's one way we've been able to get around some of the um, high density and fill developments. And, and the site size. Um, so once you draw um, your site footprint, uh, you can create a scenario. And so if you're thinking about um, existing conditions versus future conditions, you can you can uh, create multiple scenarios that use the same footprint and then edit the parameters for it uh, beyond that. Um, and again, this is a really important step for bringing in all of the information from that backend database. So this will automatically calculate all of the, the these variables, the population, the density, the transit accessibility, all of that information will be provided. Um, so the second step, which is which is pretty similar to the EPA MXC process, is there's a built-in um, rates from the ITE handbook. Um, this is currently working with ninth edition, um, where you can pull in the ITE codes and and specify the, the development program of the site. Um, and again, you can choose with this drop-down between the average, uh, the equation, as you would with, with ITE that I was just describing earlier. And then this is um, kind of digging in one step further to all the information that the tool automatically pulls in. You can uh, toggle through the various data sources that are provided. So you can use your judgment to check that that's a reasonable value for your site. So it does populate all of this automatically, but that allows um, the analyst to spend more time actually ground truthing and checking that information to make sure that it's reasonable. Um, so this is just showing the household size variable, which is an important one, but um, you can also do this for the site demographics, for the trip lengths that we pull out of the model. Um, the accessibility, proximity table, vehicle ownership, for a variety of the different uh, D's variables. 
And then the results that you get out of, of the Main Street tool um, include the external vehicle trip generation. Um, so again, it provides the comparison of ITE, uh, ITE with, um, with the adjustments from the handbook. Um, so that might be a little more in line with what I hope we'll, we'll get a chance to see from the original traffic studies. Um, and then also calculations of vehicle miles traveled. Um, so using the trip lengths that we pull in from, uh, from the regional model to calculate reductions of BMT. So this is that slide that Matthew was referring to um, with, the, with the increased accuracy. And there's a, there's a middle step in between here. So ITE, almost 50% overestimate in the validation that we did. ITE with the handbook adjustments gets it a lot closer, 18% overestimate. There's kind of a middle step in between there that isn't on the slide that I think is about 8% um, for EPA MXD. And then this is MXD plus gets it to within 4% for the validation sites that we tested. So here are the results, um, just showing two here, although the remaining sites will come out um, after the after the TRIPS DC presentation as well. Um, but you can see that that same kind of pattern applies. So these are the same results for a Clarendon Center, um, where EPA MXD got us a little bit closer to the observed. And you can see that um, MXD Plus approach gets us still not perfect, but much, much closer to the observed uh, trip making for that site. And it's I thought it was interesting. It seemed like that comparison of 8% off for EPA MXD to 4% off for MXD Plus, it seems like we're seeing a much better convergence of the results here than, than that would have suggested. So maybe um, in a more dense context like Arlington, MXD Plus really does an even better job than it did in the, in the validation sites that we have collected. The, one of the demographics is the um, mode split from, is it the mode split from the uh, Household survey or not? So the um, census data has mode split for households, and is that incorporated at all into the? Um, I don't think, think so. exogenous mode split is a is a factor. I mean, it's only for the resident. It would only help for residential. <coughs> it doesn't apply. I've seen at least in Crystal City and Huntington City that the the data that we're getting out of our analysis is getting much closer to the uh, the, the census data at a much broader level. Because this still doesn't predict mode split, um, it's still just focusing on auto reduction. Um, but the question was earlier, really like, what if you want mode split? Um, it might, that might be a good data set to sort of take this and tease out the reductions. And, Essentially, yeah, and I, think it, I think it's more mode split as a mode as a trip reduction factor. Yeah, becomes that. Yeah, I think we kind of get at that through the transit accessibility issues and the walkability uh, variables. Okay. Other questions about MXC Plus and Main Street before we move on to the Trips DC tool? And if, as that percolates, we can serve as discuss later as well. Um, to your knowledge of what VDOT is accepting, is any extension of MXD acceptable, or is that written in such a way that it's pretty tailored to the original model? Um, we would have to follow up with them. They uh, did a survey of various tools, um, and they ended up accepting MXD as one of several um, trip generation, trip analysis tools that they would I, said, I, I can't think a more refined version of MXD would be a problem, so we would have to have that <coughs> I don't think that would need to be confirmed at a certain sense, whereas MXD is, is accepted. We got a VDOT person on the webinar. We could pose that question. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
just displaying the visual and you're very happy with the results of our tool. That's D dot rather than D dot. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Great segue. So we'll move into the D dot tool. Okay, so this is the um, highest level of sophistication for trip generation. Really, um, IT has always recommended local data where available. And um, most recently, for the for we just finished our third year working with DDOT on developing a custom um, trip generation tool that's sensitive to kind of the urban context that we see in the district. Um, they really wanted to distinguish between good transit accessibility and great transit accessibility. So uh, while we started with, um, with the process to calibrate and validate the MXD plus model for the district, we, in the end, um, basically started from the ground up with new data, new variables. So the D TRIPS DC really is its own uh, trip generation model at this point. Uh, so this is the evolution of the tool. We started um, with a, on the left, we started with a user-friendly spreadsheet tool that similar to EPA MXD was meant to just be downloaded and used um, and with a friendly user guide. Um, but here in the bottom right corner is where we are today. Trips DC is live and publicly available and uh, DDOT is working on their um, kind of rollout and implementation of the tool. But it's, it's there for you to play around with in the meantime. So um, it all started with the data collection. Data collection for a custom trip generation tool is the most significant financial investment. Um, essentially, they conducted raw um, door counts at each of these at more than 50 sites. Um, more than 60 sites, really, but more than but uh, about 52 sites ended up being used in the model. Um, so people were stationed at every single door to the building. Sometimes some of these buildings had up to 17 doors, so really a lot of man, man and woman power. Um, so people were stationed for raw door counts as well as intercept surveys, asking people what mode they used um, to travel. And then they also collected parking supply data on site. Um, so really a significant effort for a mix of residential and retail, residential over retail primarily. There were a few hotel sites that were collected, um, but ultimately were not used in the model. Um, a couple of <coughs> residential only sites were used. Um, and yeah, so the TRIPS DC model is purely for residential and retail land uses only to today. The way it works is it's a two-step model. Um, in, as I mentioned, it's kind of a standalone tool. So in the process, we evaluated probably more than 20 variables for what was sensitive within the district. And ultimately, for the first time, this trip generation tool does not pivot from ITE. It is truly a standalone tool where the person trip <coughs> model first estimates just the, the total person trips to and from the site um, for AM and PM. Uh, peaks, and it is purely based on just the regression analysis of the district data. The next step of the model is the mode choice model, which from that total person trip estimate um, calculates the four modes, auto, transit, walk, and bike. So we are able to um, kind of estimate exactly how many bike trips you could expect from this mixed use development, how many walk trips, how many transit trips. Um, for the first time, the tool is sensitive to the amount of parking supply provided on site. So our research showed that, yes, uh, increased parking supply induces vehicle travel. So seems pretty intuitive for everyone in the room, but believe it or not, um, there, there's very little hard data to prove that fact. So uh, this tool has been really pivotable with that. Did we see pricing cost information? I know that that's, can be pretty high in yeah. as well. Um, pricing information was collected at some sites, but it's not really standardized. Every site is kind of different. Mm -hmm. So same thing with um, whether the parking was designated <coughs> between residential or retail. Ultimately, we just did general parking supply for the model. Yeah. But DDOT invested a lot of time and uh, financial resources in their site, which is actually a big um, 
uh, resource for IT's trip, uh, 10th edition trip generation manual, which um, now includes person trip data, uh, which I, is almost predominantly DC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just the kind of into the weeds statistical analysis to show you how accurate the model is. Um, the dotted line diagonally is the best fit line for, for observed trips to um, predicted estimates. ITE is shown in blue. This is the AM peak for vehicle trips. And uh, the final DDOT model is in red. You can see how we're getting, with the red, we're getting closer to that line of best fit. And particularly on the next slide for the PM, you can see really how ITE is overestimating PM peak vehicle trips in the district and how accurate we're getting with our model. So again, it started with the Excel-based spreadsheet tool. Just to show you the, the, the options available, if not everyone has to do a web application. Um, so it started with this user-friendly spreadsheet tool, inputting your project name and uh, creating scenarios. Um, as, as you wish, if you're, say, from the consultant perspective, you're testing out di different development scenarios, what, what's going to put you over the edge of creating an impact in your study area versus what's not? So um, uh, it allows you to analyze those different scenarios and uh, input your on-site parking supply, like we said, because that is um, kind of a, a um, influential factor for the model. And then it's preloaded with the, um, this, so, Right now, Trips DC does not pivot from IT, but the first version, this Excel spreadsheet version, did pivot from IT, which is why it was preloaded with the IT rates um, that you could select with your land uses. Again, it's it was always only residential over retail, so while all the upper, all the options from IT were in there, you're really only selecting uh, apart general apartment 220 and uh, shopping center retail 820, which. Um, I'm sure we could debate all day that those land uses are not appropriate for the district, which is, uh, again, the reason for the custom tool. Um, so with those land use inputs, the model would spit out your total person trips at the top, um, always showing a comparison to ITE in blue, uh, DDOT, um, trips DC in yellow. Um, and then you could toggle between your modes. You could select auto, transit, bike, and walk. Um, you could also show just the four mode split or the two mode split. The two mode split is just auto and non-auto um, compared to the four mode split. And the idea was that you know a, a traffic consultant could easily um, screenshot this or PDF it and include it in their traffic study in their appendix. And there you have your trip generation streamlined, accurate um, to kind of help the the process for the traffic study. We had a question on the computer, I think, from VDOTS. Oh, and it was related to the last slide. Okay. Um, the R squared, if you have any sense of that. Oh, uh, not off the top of my head. It's always hit or miss who's going to ask about the R squared. Um, <laughs> but we can follow up. With yeah, that. we can follow up. And actually, the other point is about that is that VDOT did a four phase process for this work, right? Yes. And it's pretty well documented, and hopefully you can provide the links to that documentation. Sure, yeah, uh, yeah. There's a TRB paper um, that was presented, and then there's a model development report, and all, all of it's really available from Trips DC. There are links to those papers, um, so we can include the website, right? Yeah. And that, that comparison on the top there for ITE versus the um, versus the DDOT yeah. and the C plus, that's a comparison to ITE vehicle trips, right? Yes. Okay. Well, no, sorry. Um, this is good question because ITE um, does only include vehicle trips and in the handbook you can get person trips. So these person trips here are from ITE's handbook. Yeah. And then with the comparison with between the modes, you would only see the comparison with auto. You wouldn't with uh, <coughs> transit walk or bike, you wouldn't um, see the comparison to ITE. Good question. And, and broad strokes, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the general trend was we've seen ITE really overestimating vehicle trips, and then as we make these refinements, we get closer, but with the person trips, we were actually noticing in the district that ITE is underestimating the total number of person trips because we have a lot more people walking, biking, taking transit yeah. um, more frequently throughout the day. Yeah. By a, By a large, a lot, large, 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 large,
Yes. Do the actual observed numbers compare to those two? Uh, no, because this is this is not um, an actual, a real site. I mean, person trips. This is a model for the Yeah, it's a sample project. Oh, it's oh, not one of the fifty project. sites okay. that was that was used to to. Um, but in general, how, how that compares. Or so if you go back to the scatter plots. Uh, oh, I'm showing the oh, trips here. Not right? yeah. We have the scatter plots for all the for all modes, person trips, and all modes. Um, but you would theoretically line up kind of the site, the red dot with the line of best fit. Okay, so this is where we are now. Um, trips DC is a is a public facing web application. Uh, www.tripsdc.org. So one, one of those two. <laughs> um, yeah. um, so the way the tool works is uh, it's, it has a number of mapping capabilities as well. Um, you can explore the data, which will take you into the model inputs and the model outputs. Um, one thing to kind of get into the weeds a little bit on the model, like I said, we, we started from scratch testing over 20 variables. And in the end, the most choice <coughs> variables really came down to um, employment within one mile, uh, job to population diversity, basically that ratio of uh, residents and employment, um, and transit competitiveness was a new variable that we tested. And transit competitiveness is the ratio of jobs within 45 minutes by transit to jobs within 45 minutes by auto. So uh, DDOT noted that while EPA MXD and MXD Plus focus on that employment within 30 minutes by transit, in the district, the commute is really 45 minutes, which I'm sure we can all relate to. Um, so we used that uh, data, which was uh, part of a research effort from the University of Minnesota to create that uh, transit competitiveness ratio um, to find which turned out to be a really significant um, variable for the model, as well as parking supply. As I mentioned, um, you know, increased parking supply induces vehicle trips. Um, yeah. So when you explore the data, you can explore those those inputs. So you can see how employment within one mile maps across the district. You can explore transit competitiveness uh, mapped across the district, um, and then so that you can kind of understand the context of the outputs that you are theoretically going to see from your project. So you can also create a scenario. And this is for the uh, traffic consultants out there. When you're uh, creating your project, you can in create a project title and put your project address. The map will navigate to your project address. You can kind of make sure it will highlight. But if it's not bringing up the correct parcel, you can, um, you can edit it to click on the right parcel. Um, Input your number of parking spaces proposed. You input your land use programming, dwelling units, and retail. Again, <laughs> it was only residential and retail at the moment. Um, and then you generate your report. And you get your outputs with total person trips, AM and PM. And then you get the percent breakdown. You get your mode share breakdown, um, as well as the, the raw. Well, yeah, here it's showing the mode. The, percent mode split between the four modes. Um, you can easily PDF this. There's a PDF output included with the web application to, again, insert into your traffic study. Um, and yeah, anytime you want to uh, test different scenarios, you can just go to edit inputs and go back to your original page to, to update. Um, one, one really interesting thing about this evolution of the tool compared to what we've seen with EPA MXD and MXD Plus is that um, because we DDOT went to the web application from the, the difference from the Excel spreadsheet to the web application, you're now um, in a GIS based tool that allows you to get to that parcel level analysis, as opposed to just taking the employment from the TAC. So your the tool is calculating for your individual parcel, your um, transit competitiveness, your employment within within one mile, it's calculating all of those variables for you. 
So one other feature of the tool is that you can see the model outputs. So essentially, if you were to run the model on every single parcel in the, in the district, this, these were the outputs by mode, which is uh, really cool from the um, from either the agency side or the consultant perspective, because theoretically, if I'm a developer, I could look at these maps and say, hey, you know what? I want to really target. I want to get away with no parking. I don't want to provide any parking on my site. So I'm going to choose a location that's really conducive to uh, walk trips, to bike trips, to transit trips. So um, you can really kind of pinpoint, even from the beginning, the developer can say, well, I know it doesn't work this way, but they could say, I want to develop there on that street corner. Um, yeah. OK, so the juicy stuff. Uh, we went ahead and tested the last three sites from Arlington in the TRIPS DC tool. How did we do this? Because we just talked about the limitations of TRIPS DC. It's only in the district, and our sites are in Arlington County, and it's only residential over retail. So we chose these three sites are, well, Dolly Madison is residential only, and then the other two sites are residential and retail. But essentially, we looked at the characteristics for these three sites in terms of employment within one mile and employment within, um, in this case, I looked at the 45 minute transit shed to pinpoint where in the district theoretically would be a, a similar neighborhood context for these sites. And I just chose a parcel and I put in that address. Um, and uh, but with all the land use program, land use programming from these Arlington County sites. Not a purest way, but kind of cool. The results are really cool for us because it's really interesting how trips, how these sites perform in the trips DC model. Um, so you can see uh, again, Dolly Madison is weird because the observed was over ITE even, but you can see in the AM we're we're pretty close in trips DC. Um, in site 402, we're getting really close. Trips DC to observed in the PM. I mean, that's when I saw that, I was like, whoa. Um, same thing for 412. Uh, we're getting really close. Again, the AM is a little, the TDM program seems to be really real, seems to be a, a factor here. Um, so I'll just let this marinate a little bit. Any questions? Again, just explain the sure. assumptions that you went. You said you chose locations in the district that you thought were similar to the locations. Yeah, based on those two factors, because from Trips DC we have employment within within one mile, and we have the uh, it's not in Trips DC, but we have it in our in our analysis the um, transit within forty five minutes and transit within thirty minutes. Um, at the parcel level, so we compared those maps visually, and I basically chose, oh yeah, this looks like it could be over in the Georgetown area. It's meeting the same attributes in, in terms of employment accessibility. Yeah. And these, we were showing these maps of the, of the outcomes of the model, but TRIPCC <laughs> also provides similarly themed maps for all of those input variables as well that you can look at to so explore the, how they change across the district. And, yeah. and this is, I'm sorry, this is auto trips? Yes, this is vehicle trips. Vehicle trips. Yeah. So, do you have any thoughts for the couple of measures where the trips to see is pretty far off from these dark numbers? What that is? Um, it's a Dolly Madison PM. Yeah. And the, um, yes, great question because Alex and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, Again, I think it goes back to the characteristics of Dolly Madison in the household size, where you're seeing um, larger units. Uh, it has one and two bedroom, but it also has three bedroom and four bedroom units um, compared to the way TRIPS, D the data that TRIPS DC was built off of um, is primarily that like one and two bedroom units um, apartment buildings. So those are gonna have different PM uh, PM characteristics, PM travel characteristics, because if you think about who's living in those buildings, in the district, in one or two bedroom units, you're getting maybe uh, young professionals or single, or you know the the PM is 
the PM travel behavior is more scattered. Whereas if you're, you might expect more families or um, in the, uh, three or four bedroom units who are, they're going home after work. Um, so it's that those are some of the items we were talking through. Are, are there any places in inputs where you can adjust for those kind of unusual situations? Uh, in trips DC, no. But you could do it off model. I mean, you could, you could, yeah, you could do it off model in conversation with, with staff. What's the point of pretty, pretty, pretty high parts. Oh, I didn't include it here. But I'm sure there's a whole lot of But I think it's probably yeah. at least one to one. Yeah. Oh, um, is it did more? Yeah. yeah, I think it is. It's probably way more. Yeah, I mean, it was 2007 development. I, just, I don't remember the rate. I remember it was over 400 spaces. 2007, the site plan. Yeah, it was 350 ish units and like 400 something spaces. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned that one of the things with the Sedona sort of Sleep <coughs> observed is you think it's the uptake of the TDM program. So that highlights somebody asked it before about do you judge from the price of market or just the quality of market? So right. it could be an insensitivity to. To the price that people are saying, what a parking with the transit for 50 to the end. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a good segue into um, even more opportunities for how do we capture some of the other, um, I guess, factors that seem to be influencing trip making behavior in the region. Um, so Alex is going to talk about uh, another quantitative tool that we use at Fair and Pierce called TDM Plus. Yeah, so thank you for that lead in. As if, as if on cue, there's another D, so we talk about the seven Ds, um, but, but another one to consider is demand management. And, um, no, well, that, no. <laughs> <laughs> that would probably be nice. Um, so, yeah, so that all of the tools that we've described so far um, exclude the effects of, of TDM programs. And so, Baron Pierce has a, a separate spreadsheet based tool called TDM Plus that, that incorporates some of those. Um, and we presented uh, to Arlington County staff before on this tool system. You may be familiar, so I won't go on this terribly long, um, but just wanted to make everyone aware that this is um, that this is available. And as, as, as we saw, some of the discrepancies between uh, trip generation in the sites that had uh, robust TDM programs, this might be one way of, of zeroing in on that on that final number. Um, so it's an Excel-based tool, as I mentioned, that we developed in House of Fair and Peers. It's based on uh, peer-reviewed research, research that was uh, developed in partnership with the California Air Pollution Control Officers Association. Um, and it's been uh, calibrated and validated to actual trip generation at sites um, in a variety of contexts. Um, and so what it does is uh, estimate site level percentage reductions for vehicle miles traveled. Um, but the mechanism for those reductions really is a reduction in trips. So you can think of it both as reducing BMT or as reducing uh, the vehicle trips that are made. Um, and it incorporates individual travel demand management strategies as well as uh, the interactions of, of having multiple strategies uh, combined. Um, and so uh, it also accounts for the land use context as one of the also one of the modules. But if, uh, if we use it in combination with a tool like MXD Plus, MXD Plus already accounts for a lot of those land use strategies. So we typically recommend turning those off and just using the TDM program type of adjustments. Good question. The Capcoa sure. research, um, roughly the dates of the research that this is based on. Yeah, I think that was oh, six ish, but we're going through a process right now of updating that research. Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering if there's anything new, new in there yet. Yeah, I don't think we have anything published yet, but I know that that's in the works. My understanding is that we we're going to get that done by the end of this year, which is about now. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, this is the model off of Capco is like earlier. The, pub the publication around 2010 that had research that led up to that. And my understanding is that the most recent data that we've gotten actually is having us drop some of the efficacy mm -hmm. estimates. Mm -hmm. So we're not quite as aggressive reductions yeah. as the yeah. old research. Um, so a variety of, of modules and types of TDM. Uh, so when we think of uh, probably the very bottom categories when we think of most often when we think about uh, travel demand management, which is community trip reduction programs, so things like van pools or transit subsidies. Oh, sorry, that's actually the transit section. Um, van pools or other employer, employer incentive programs that I know Arlington has a pretty robust program to support. Um, transit improvements uh, to, the, uh, to the transit service or uh, subsidies to reduce the costs. 
Um, parking pricing uh, it is, comes in through TDM Plus, so where that's not accounted for in, in DDoT MXT or in any of the MXT tools. Um, there is some research on the effects of, of priced parking uh, in employment contexts. And then uh, neighborhood enhancement strategies, so things like uh, bike share or car share or, or different amenities that are available surrounding the site. When you talk about transit system improvements, you're talking about increasing headway, or are you talking about amenity-based type improvements? Uh, predominantly service. Service, headway. yeah. Um, and so this is what a typical uh, page from the tool looks like. So individual strategies uh, in a particular category. So this is the, the land use example. So this is one that we probably wouldn't end up using if it's in combination with MXT, but it just gives an example of the types of adjustments that you can make. So all of the um, elasticities that were pulled from the research have been incorporated here. And each one of these has an individual effect, but you can see up at the top, it says category reduction. So you can see all of these different effects, and if you do the math on these, it adds up to more than that 45.9% reduction, um, but part of the development of the tool is to place caps on, on the interactions of the strategy. So there are some are some synergistic um, combinations, but in general, if you uh, there's, there's kind of a, a limit to the amount of reduction that you can get. And then there are also, uh, there's also a global maximum reduction, so across each of those categories, when we combine all of those effects, uh, the tool limits the total reduction that can be taken there. Um, so just a little bit of a flavor for um, an additional uh, tool that's available to adjust the trip generation. Um, so those are those are the tools that we have for you. I guess just by way of by way of wrapping that up and kind of delivering in home that EPA MXD, which was kind of the the driver of our, our being here today, um, does improve the trip generation accuracy in in mixed use settings like Arlington County. Um, so that helps to give a better understanding of what the impacts of that development program are and, and to think about the kind of, of land use development patterns that the county might want to have. Um, but there are additional tools available and we've shown that since uh, since the DMXD we've made several improvements. Um, so partially that's just streamlining the process, taking some of those more cumbersome calculations and, and making them easier to provide, but also the ability to provide uh, more multimodal detail, the individual person trips and trips by mode, um, and also to account for some of the variables that aren't included in EPA MXD, including the parking supply, additional uh, fees and context factors, and the idea that you could build on top of this tool to something to analyze uh, and management programs. And I think uh, just one final thought, one um, point we wanted to make with the progression of quantitative tools, you increase your, your, your power in your land use decision making. Um, for example, with the TRIPS DC tool, it's still being vetted, but theoretically it can now be used in, in neighborhood meetings and you can see that, no, this proposed development, while you think it may, it may um, be bringing all these vehicle trips, it's really going to actually bring bike and walk trips and perhaps now we should be investing in uh, safer pedestrian crossings or increased uh, bicycle infrastructure. Maybe we need more bike racks. How can we, you can actually show residents that no, you think there should be more parking on this site, but you can see if you tick up that parking number by 50 spaces, how it impacts the, the vehicle mode share that you're getting in your outputs. So um, with the increased progression of tools, you're, you're getting, you're increasing your power in communicating um, on your developments. That's yeah. actually the question that was running through my mind as you were explaining this. Um, we often have a lot of difficulty when we're dealing with community in believing these numbers. They always greatly exaggerate the amount of traffic that they anticipate, and then this is even bringing, bringing it down further. Have you had examples or reactions from the general public in some of these scenarios um, with respect <coughs> to to the, the reductions in traffic that these Not quite yet on TRIPS DC. Um, with MXD Plus, I think as we were, we've used, we've been using it internally for, uh, since I've been at Baron Pierce, so uh, more than five years. Um, so we have, I, I guess, um, we have a lot of evidence now to show how our numbers back up with the monitoring process that occurs at the site afterwards. 
Um, so that data, I feel like in those situations, we always point to the data. It's not, we're not bringing our, we're, we're just presenting the numbers and you can take what you want from it. Um, so I think from that, that's kind of what we're, what we're working with at that point. Yeah, but, yeah, and a strategy for addressing that might be kind of the early stages of what we're, what we're talking about doing. And we've, we've looked at these five sites, and it sounds like there's a lot more data available within the county. And I think that that might be the most compelling thing is, is that gap between here's what's in the study and here's what actually ends up happening when the development's on the ground. This is evidence based. I think those are the key <coughs> words. Um, in California, which I know has a very litigious uh, environment, um, there's actually a lot of push now. Uh, people are saying you can't get into E. Because it's, dem it's demonstrated that it's inaccurate, um, uh, so it's you know it, this is much more evidence-based than what a lot of uh, advocates, especially anti-project uh, advocates, will be asking you to use. And there are differences, right, between urban context and suburban context. You know, Trip CC is not going to work for more suburban environments, or maybe maybe it does. We don't know yet. Um, but I think it's really just like the, the theory of trip generation is pretty constant, even from ITE to, to now how it's progressed. You know, what would you do as an engineer? Well, I would go to a comparable site. I would find the data and I would say, how does this comparable site or I would do a trip generation study at that comparable site and I would compare it to the results. It's the same concept that that theory is constant throughout all the tools. We've got a question from VDOT online, which you were starting to hit on there, but maybe just to be more pointed, where would you not use the DC MXD model? And maybe, um, and what would those circumstances be? And maybe you could talk a little bit about um, urban versus rural or the yeah. DC model versus, like you, you experimented on Arlington sites with the DC model versus yeah. MXD plus. Yeah, so at this point, I would not use the DC model outside of DC. Uh, this was a fun exercise for us and has not really been vetted. Um, it's it's definitely would be like the ideal situation for Alex and I. I think we have we have dreams, but um, yeah, I would not use it outside of the district. You also it's and all this information is on the Trips DC website as well, kind of how when and how you should use the tool. Um, in terms of even within the district, how, what are the, similar to how we have the page zero for MXD, we have a similar threshold for TRIPS DC. So um, in terms of in this region applying MXD plus, I would again uh, go back to page zero to evaluate, you know, what are the, what are the urban, or not the urban, but what are the neighborhood context variables that we're looking at and how does that, um, compared to what the model was built off of. I still believe in Matthew's point that it doesn't mean you shouldn't use the model. It's just, we're just saying clear black and white, this is what the model was based off of. So that's when you bring your, your infamous engineering judgment to the table. Um, yeah, and so I, I still think that even in like suburban, suburban Maryland, I think, suburban Virginia, you know, outside of Northern Virginia, I think it's still, there's still a case to be made for um, ITE overestimating vehicle trips, but we don't have as much evidence-based um, data yet to prove that we're working on that. Yeah. And one question. Uh, so you have MXD plus and it gets us closer, but for Arlington, there's real value in getting person trips, walk trips, transit trips, bike trips. Because when we think about site plans and use permits, each one is kind of a retrofit of a piece of land to make it more accessible. Yeah. Um, and so is that, has any community like done an add-on module for like MXD Plus and then a conversion to, to get you to those um, trips by mode? Um, so internally, MXD Plus now um, estimates person trips for us. And so perhaps I, I think what some projects are doing is they're using person trips and then maybe going to the mode splits out of census to apply that. Um, but at this, so that's, but I think when you, you first have to ask your question is, is it best for us to pivot from MXD Plus? Or is it best for us to pivot from TRIPS DC? Because to me, that's kind of what some of this data, the three sites that we tested, are, are 
um, bringing to, to light, I think, is how much can we pivot from, is it, what's the best case scenario to pivot from which tool? MXD Plus, you guys can use for um, development other than residential over retail. Yes. So for us, where where DC is predominantly developing in a residential residential over retail trend, we are much more scattered. Yeah. Um, and so inherently, probably MXD Plus fits more of our development pattern. Um, just as a and MXD Plus does generate person trips, right? So it generates person trips and vehicle trips. And yes, but I will say it doesn't, it doesn't estimate person trips the way Trips DC estimates person trips, right. okay. where it's right. kind right. of directly from the Your data. Trips. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's one, I think it just, depends on the appetite for data collection, because if you, you know, theoretically you could add other mixed uses to data sets, or you could, it again, it, you, there are options to go either way. You're kind of at a fork in the road. But um, normally you're seeing that the person trips are underestimated and the vehicle trips are kind of close in the when I've seen plus. Yeah. So if you if you make the statement that all trips that are not SOV are eventually a walk pedestrian environment trip, either by transit meeting that last connection to the, the, the door or straight up pedestrian, you've got a minimum sense of what the sort of come through that door, that front door rather than the garage estimates. Is that a fair statement? As as people who have evolved this tool, I mean, what we're really hoping is that Alexander, we didn't mention, has also done trip generation surveys in the same uh, methodology that DDAP did uh, for how many sites? 20. 20 sites. Um, you guys have, I hope Arlington County has a bunch of data. DDAP has data, but it's really just residential or retail. There is on these a synergy uh, mm -hmm. that could be accomplished, which is to take the, something like Trips DC and expand it for regional use, um, which DDOT gets out of that, that they expand the land use care types that they could model, and you guys get out of that, that you get all the attributes that, the, that Trips DC has, but that's for you guys to work out. <laughs> Express the budget in that future year. Um, follow up question about MXD Plus. So, what we saw in your presentation was the um, the uh, interface that's Main Street, but you described it as a, a an Excel tool or a, a something, a formula, a thing. If we don't have Main Street, can we still use MXD Plus, and how does that work? It's a good question. So yeah, MXD Plus, the our implementation of MXD Plus has evolved over time. It's something that currently we just use in house, um, but that's something that we could discuss developing a. We could develop a spreadsheet-based tool for Arlington or, or up to a web-based tool. So MXD Plus is not currently publicly available like the EPA MXD model is. Correct. All the underlying research is available, but we do not give away the spreadsheet. Okay. Are you working with ITE and partnering organizations maybe um, other groups uh, to, to get a uniform data collection method to implement nationally so that we can then sort of all be pooling information under the same characteristics. So yeah, go the ahead. methodology that DDOT has used is now, it's actually an adaptation, I think, of a methodology that San Francisco used, uh, and that's becoming sort of standardized as the best practice. It is not completely consistent with the methodology that ITE espouses. Are you talking about the data collection? Yeah, I'm just... Yeah, so we, we, we worked with DDOT and San Francisco maybe two years back <clears> on <throat> both presentations that described all of our data collection together, but we've also updated our... Um, data collection methodology to better align with the, particularly the all 
the multimodal trip generation that DDOT's um, methodology outlines. Like they have a very nice methodological document so that anyone can kind of pull it off, pull it off the shelf and go and collect good data at their buildings. We just internalized that into our site plan data collection. So now we have uh, intercept counts to collect pedestrian trips, for instance, which in the, the handful of buildings we looked at today, we, this is predates that. This was just for vehicle trip purposes, but but we collect that data now at new buildings. And just for the record, that's what we do to all of our offices if we do trip generation surveys. You is essentially the DDAC methodology at this point. Hey, this is Stephanie in DC. Um, maybe it doesn't. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we, we hey, this is Stephanie. Can you hear me? Here, and we started this last year. Um, yeah. And we're a unique place because we put a lot of money in this this research and this effort, and we're but we're still only developing sites at a rate of you know a handful mm -hmm. to a dozen a year at best. So it's it's a lot of data coming out for a very small um, use of the data. <coughs> so, arguably, our small area plans and other studies could well be informed by that. Yeah, I was going to say, um, there's a lot of opportunity to use this, these data that we haven't even explored yet. Primarily, we've been focused on how do we help inform the development approval process, and that's that um, runs away at its own speed regardless of whether we're ready for it. So we spend a lot of time telling people, we'd like you to use our aggregate studies of these data so you don't just go and cherry pick the buildings with the outcomes you like that happen to be near the buildings that are being proposed. Um, but it's hard and when you don't have a lot of examples, for instance, um, grocery stores and the 750 North Green project that had a big grocery store, we really had to go out and find all of our grocery store data as a, a feed into some semblance of, a, of an understanding of what was going to happen there. Um, but small area plans, MTP, um, even transportation facility design, if you know a lot about more than we ever knew before about what's going on in the neighborhood and what kind of multimodal trip generation is happening there, you may make a different decision on what facilities you're planning to put in. And we haven't right. used it that way before. Right. Well, that's kind of a good question, too, that I just want to ask you all is, um, it, it, could you use the DC model for like a small sub-area study to get like your trip generation? We've done that with MXD Plus and with Main Street. I think the example I showed was the, the Black and Alley project that we did hypothetically. Um, for Trips DC, I think because it's limited to residential or retail, it makes it a challenge in that if it's if there are other uses on the within the, the small area plan. Also because the way it's set up right now is that you input your address and your address is your site. You can't it wasn't designed to draw your to aggregate. Yeah. So if even if you if we had that capability to draw whether you're you were drawing this one parcel site versus a three block site, um, that would also kind of get to your question, but just the way the, the tool was developed um, was purely based on the address, the site level. So you may want to read what Stephanie does yeah. time doesn't oh. Can you all hear me at all? You want to read it out loud? Stephanie said, ITE is having conversations about person trip generation methods. There's not yet concurrence on DDOT's methodology overall, since not everyone is as focused on multimodal information as we are. But it is also worth talking to Christy Currens and Kelly Clifton at uh, Portland State University about what they've seen. Christy's thesis used multimodal trip generation data from many jurisdictions. Do you want to speak to that? Um, Yes, so actually in the commercial building study that we released in 2016, we compared what her, so she, yeah, she wrote a thesis based on household travel surveys in a few places around the country, and then developed, um, pivoting off of ITE, but um, uh, trip generation for multiple modes and with um, information about density, and I think there might be one or two other variables, but anyway, it's a very simple, simple equation set, but it actually produced trip generation results that were very similar to the buildings in the commercial building site. So it's actually, 
much um, more, it's actually much simpler than any of these models, and it could be a good reference point. And that comparison's in the report, right, Stephen? We put that in the report. I think comparison. so. I'm pretty sure. So if you go on Mobility Lab and look up the commercial building aggregate study, um, which is up there now, it, it's got <coughs> that We also, piece. to the to the credit of the other gentleman on the phone, we or on the line, we also had Fabri and Vinaglia's work that was similar. Oh, I didn't even make that connection. Yeah. Right. Good job, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Not to derail the conversation, but I do also just want to, um, I guess, drop the seed that trip trip generation is continuing to evolve, continuing to change. Um, the data from TRIPS DC was collected in 2013, 2014, 2013, in there, 2015, I think, some of the sites. So, um, you know, this is before Uber and Lyft were around, but it's just kind of increased exponentially. When we uh, collected data in Alexandria um, last year, no, this, it's earlier this year, um, we were some of the some of the hotel sites. It was 30% TNC use um, for the from the vehicle trips. So um, I guess to have a, a data collection program where you're constantly collecting data is is really gonna um, just again empower you in the future. Do you have, um, to that point, so I just wanted to read, Stephanie mentioned the data was from 2013-14 and Big Push in 15, Dita is doing comparisons to data collected this summer. Um, for a program like ours where we are collecting it in a pseudo ongoing basis, I mean, we can't go out there and demand every building provide yeah. us data every year, but we do have a means to, to get these data in an ongoing way. What's the best way to use data like that that's coming in in a flow that might be repeats at certain at certain locations. Is this something where you just periodically update a model that you keep and populate it with newer data and recalibrate or readjust? Like how 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 would you use an ongoing flow of data like that? Yeah, good question. And we kind of we we tried to think about this in Trips DC as well in terms of when should we think about updating the model, et cetera. And I think especially now we're just seeing Yes, it hasn't. It's it's only been a few years, but we're just seeing rapid change in the few years that we have. So, um, to the extent you have your regular data collection um, processes in place, I think every you know five years it doesn't hurt to to test how this tool is. This tool still um, making sense to us, and in the meantime, you're also evaluating. Okay, what new transit has come online? Um, are there other input variables that that need to be thought about to kind of really distinguish between that uh, great transit accessibility versus good transit accessibility? That was a big um, that was a a big element to Trips DC in the last phase, kind of really hitting on the when we first when the data was collected and when we were first developing the model, uh, DC streetcar wasn't open even you know the first line. So that was something we really wanted to capture even that. And, but there was existing bus service that was really um, uh, accessible along that corridor. So uh, the last phase of work was really, and that was really focused on distinguishing and, and capturing that great transit accessibility um, with the transit competitiveness variable. So I think that once you're, first you can look at if you are repeating your data collection at a given site, so you can see just at a single site, you know, within a three year or five year time span, I think you said two years or five years you collect data. So if you're at your single site, if you're seeing significant vehicle trip generation and your performance metrics continue to be based on vehicle trips or however they're, whatever your performance metrics are, are evolving to in terms of your thresholds, um, or if you're seeing significant differences for a single site and how it's evolving, then that might and you're seeing that repeated, you know, five and ten sites. Then I think that is building a case for um, recalibrating and validating your model. Can, can you elaborate? You said that um, trip generation is changing a lot right now, and you mentioned the Uber and Lyft phenomenon. What are you? What are you seeing? What makes you say that? Are you saying that we're getting that? We have a whole other presentation on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Well, in like three words. <laughs> <laughs> Lots more, of cars. More TNC trips. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Is it, 
More trips. Are you or more trips. Yeah. Just more trips in general. Well, you want but to talk not necessarily about cutting out of walking trips or cutting out of. You're talking about the New York, Denver, and San Francisco, just as the highlights. Yeah, so um, this is kind of paraphrasing some of the research that we've seen, but the, if you might have seen the, the Bruce Schaller Unsustainable report about Uber usage in, mm -hmm. in New York. Um, I forget, it was a, a Cal researcher, I think, who did the work in San Francisco and some of the University of Denver. Um, basically looking at users of transportation network companies and where they came from. And uh, a large number of the trips are actually new induced trips. So some of them are already are moving from uh, from already auto trips to continue to take DNCs, just a shared vehicle instead of their own vehicle. Um, but a lot of them are moving from walk and bike trips and transit trips. Right. And then even more still are completely new induced trips. So it was 12%, 10 or 12% were induced. Yeah. And does that include the the empty vehicle circulation trip, sort of the, the deadheading of yes. the TNC? For, for VMT, yeah. So the number of trips, yeah, I think it was like 12% were induced, and I think like 50% were shifted from other modes, including that 12%. So about not 50% non-auto mode. So there's yeah. a total increase of 50% in VMT. And then when yeah, when you're looking at the VMT, the the one researcher basically just drove around as an Uber driver and kept track of his mileage. Um, so it's a small sample size, but he found that he was driving 69 for every 100 miles that he was driving with a passenger, he was driving an additional 69 miles solo, either to debt yeah deadhead to and from where he wants to start working and then just to pick up in between. But it does raise the question, that, I mean, all these tools are sort of backwards looking. They're looking back at what the yeah. trends were during the choke period, right. and we need tools that are actually kind of forward looking. So your question about, you know, long, getting longitudinal data, data over time at, at similar sites, or at same sites. Right. Um, one of our contentions is that the TNCs are essentially mimicking what an AV future might be. It's heavily subsidized, you don't have to drive kind of environment. Um, and so getting that longitudinal information, whether it feeds into MXD or not, is just right. useful in terms of allowing you to then forecast out 20 years. Even things like the COD model, right. it's a backward looking tool. It doesn't have a mode, share, a mode component related to TNCs, right. let alone autonomous vehicles. And that's my biggest concern with any model. I mean, all models are wrong at some level, but um, but when we're, you know, TDM plus relying on CAPCOA from 2010, which relies on data from before 2010, and um, and what we're describing right now, and even our data sets are still point in time what's happening today. And all we can do is wait a couple of years and aggregate it all together and say, this is what was happening three years ago. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to shift people's perspective forward and to start um, making assumptions about what might happen next year. Well, and there's probably two different purposes. For the development community, you probably want to be heavily researched, backward looking. But for long range planning, you do not, I mean, you would like to have some Even the developer review, though, buildings, you're about to approve a building that's going to that's gonna stand there and live there and, and function for 30 years or however long. So, I mean, even development review, we're trying to push people to see not what was happening in this neighborhood three years ago, but what is probably going to happen in this na same neighborhood with this building there in 15 years. Kind of justify lower and, parking ratios. I, and I think one of the challenges that we're starting to see with this is we've put a lot of effort in one part of the process, which is the trip generation, trip uh, mode split side, but the performance measures that people are using aren't keeping up. Like we're still rooted in in level of service mm -hmm. where we're not broadly establishing pretty uniform performance measures on the other modes or yeah. Do you want to go very yeah. high level of the Montgomery County? Yeah, I was going to say, we've been doing some work with Montgomery County on kind of going all the way back and actually 18 minutes in the room and helps uh, from Tool. Uh, really, they, they wanted us to, to improve their models, and that was kind of the broad charge at the beginning of the project. And we kind of went back and said, improve them to do what? You know, what's important? And so we went back and looked at all of their policy goals, and they have some phenomenal forward looking things about being a multimodal community and supporting biking and walking and supporting transit use, that all of their performance measures are, as you're saying, going back to level of service. And so we um, recommended some new performance metrics that get to auto, but also other uh, multimodal considerations, thinking about accessibility, transit accessibility, um, even within auto, not just looking at the effect on adjacent intersections or even intersections farther afield from the site, but thinking about vehicle miles traveled, vehicle person hours traveled in the vehicle, um, and, and overall trip duration as well, just how long people are actually spending in the vehicle. Can I, I'll just say I'll the trip duration. Okay. I, was, I don't want to call off the conversation. I just want to say you've given this group a tremendous amount to think about, uh, and uh, you've shared a lot of information, which I think is valuable. As we continue to 
try to plot a course. I mean, our goal, at least for the development for review process, is to provide some tools that actually capture how these buildings are going to perform in the built environment um, and that are defensible. And one of our challenges is that we have residents of Arlington that simply do not believe that transit-oriented development works. That they see a very simple equation of more development equals more traffic equals lower quality of life, and it's bad. Um, and I think our developments perform much better than that. Um, but our goal is to provide, you know, again, a consistent methodology that gets gets us closer to how these buildings are actually going to function. Um, so I want to thank you. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, and it sounds like no one, like, is no jurisdiction nationwide is really fully there. Um, but there's a lot of good work being done. Melissa, you uh, organized the session. Do you want us to have any, um, like any other comments? I, I just want to thank Carol Cruz for yeah. coming out and doing this presentation. It's a lot of good detail. Um, we have copies of their PowerPoint slide. Um, so I've said this presentation has been recorded and we will make it available in the future, probably on Mobility Lab is where it's going to live. Um, so we can remember these questions and some of the answers to the questions that go beyond what the slides discuss. Um, but I would, this we, we tried to keep this as wide an invitation as possible. Um, I encourage those of you um, who are in attendance to follow our MMTA update process that um, that we're undergoing. Dennis mentioned a public um, forum that we're going to have in late January that's going to discuss land use and transportation in Arlington um, in general, but it's going to feature more about the MMTA process, multimodal um, transportation assessment process, as well as other initiatives that Arlington COT and um, in collaboration with CKT and others are undertaking to really make good land use and transportation decisions together. Um, and we love your input. So if you have thoughts coming out of this presentation about what directions you think Arlington needs to go moving forward, please send them to us. Um, that's all I got, and thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.